By the end of this video, I promise you will be able to harness the power of this vlogging beast of a camera, the Sony ZV-E10. Hey guys, how's it going? It's Jay from Sony Alpha Lab, and I'm super excited about this video because what I got for you today is the Sony ZV-E10. Now, this isn't a review, this is the beginner's guide. All right, so to start this video off, I'm gonna show you what to do when you first take the camera out of the box. You're gonna have to charge the battery, you gotta put the memory card in there, and you gotta go through the initial setup procedure. It's very easy, but for somebody that's never done it before, it might be a little confusing, so I'm gonna go through it with you. And then after that, I'm gonna go around the camera, show you what all the buttons do, show you how to use the camera and stuff like that. Then we're gonna go into the menu system, and I'm gonna break down some of the features that this camera offers. All the features that you need to know. All right guys, so if you wanna skip ahead to a particular topic, Topic, just look below in the description area and I have a bunch of timestamps. All right, let's just get right into it. All right guys, so when, once you open up the box for the Sony ZV-1, this is what you end up with here. These are all the little parts that come in the kit. I got mine with a 16 to 50 millimeter kit lens, so it came, comes to about $800. However, you can just get the camera body itself without the lens and that'll be about $700. So this is what it looks like with my kit. So I'm not gonna put the camera neck strap on cause it's kind of a, it's kind of cumbersome to show off the settings and stuff on the camera with the strap. But I do recommend you put that strap on. It just weaves through these nice large strap holes, which I really like. But anyway, I'm not gonna put that on now. That's just what that is. Now this thing is a wind diffuser. That's what this looks like. It looks like a rabbit's foot. It actually goes into the, or the hot shoe here and it covers this screen. This screen is the on-camera microphone. It's a very high quality mic for a built-in mic on a camera. And this wind diffuser will help you out big time if it comes to like windy stuff when you're outside. So that's what this is. And I highly recommend you use it when using the camera in any kind of conditions with wind. I'm gonna leave it off for now though because it's a little bit harder to see some of the buttons. Pretty much the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to put the battery in and start charging it. Now, this is the charging solution that Sony gives you. They do sell standalone wall chargers, but it doesn't come with this camera. So what you gotta do is you gotta put the battery in the camera and then you gotta use this cable to charge the camera that way. So it's just a USB cable. It has a USB-C on one side, which is this side here that plugs into the camera. And then this side here is what plugs into the charger. So that goes in like that. And now this guy's ready to go. So you just need to plug this into the wall, plug this into the camera. Now let me show you how to put the battery in. On the bottom of the camera, you have this little door. You just slide this little lever over there and then the door pops open. And in there is the chamber where the battery goes. Now, here's the battery. And as you can see, it's an NPFW50. And I recommend getting a couple extra of these because the battery life is not that good on this camera. Um, just so you're aware, definitely get a few more of these. You don't want to have a dead camera in the field in the middle of a shoot. And also, you're going to need to put a memory card in there. I recommend this kind of memory card. I'll put a link below. They're fairly affordable and they work amazing. Um, but basically that goes in this little slot right here next to the battery and it goes like this. Just slides in there and it clicks in. So if you wanna take it out, you gotta click it and you can see it kind of pops out there and then you can grab it and pull the card out. And same thing with the battery. It has that little blue lever there. If you press that blue lever, the battery pops out and then you can grab the battery with the tips of your fingers. It's kind of hard to grab because it only comes out a little bit, but then you can get the battery up. So like I said, see how it locks in there? So now the battery's in there, push the memory card. Now the memory card's in there, we close the door. It doesn't automatically lock. You have to slide this over and uh, now the thing's ready to charge. But while we're on the bottom of the camera, let me just show you this. This is where the tripod thread is. It's a quarter inch thread and you can hook up a uh, tripod plate or you could mount it to various rigs using that thread on the bottom. That's what that is for. I'll show you that in more detail in a little bit. All right, so let's plug this thing in. On the side of the camera, you have a door here. If you stick your nail in there, you'll be able to like pop open that door. And now you can see there's ports in there. So what you have is the USB-C port. So that's the port that you're gonna use to transfer the photos and videos off the camera and also to charge the camera. Now down here is the micro HDMI port. You're gonna use that if you wanna hook this up to a monitor or a TV or something like that. Below that is the headphone jack. And up here, that red one is the microphone jack. You can see up there. So I'm gonna plug the USB-C into the USB-C port right there like this. 
All right, so you're gonna plug this in like so. I just got an extension cord here for demonstration purposes. And you'll see here on the bottom, right below where the cord plugs in, you see that orange light that lit up? That's how you know the camera's charging. So that light will go out when the camera is 100% charged. So I'm just gonna unplug this because I already have it fairly charged. All right, so walking around the camera, once again, we have the hot shoe up here. We have the built-in microphone. We have here a mode button. Now this is a really cool feature, this mode button, because it makes it easier to use the camera. It makes it simpler and it makes it more beginner oriented. You have a photo mode, a video mode, and then an S and Q mode. And S and Q stands for slow and quick video. So you can set that up for whatever you want. I'll show you that more in more detail in a moment. And of course you have the on and off toggle. So you just slide that over to turn it on. You also have the record button here. You have a dial here that'll help you navigate in various ways, depending on what mode you're in. It has a nice feedback on that dial. You also have the shutter button. If you press the center button, that's the shutter button for taking photos. And then you have a zoom lever here, which you can use to zoom in and out when you have a power zoom lens like this one. But you can also use this in the playback area when you're reviewing your images, you can zoom in and out to get a closer look at your images using that that way. Now, looking at it from the back, you have a nice large three inch LCD screen and you have a thumb rest here for your thumb, which is pretty sweet. And you have a bunch of buttons on the back. Now you got the menu button, That'll bring you into the menu system, which is ridiculous. You'll see that in a minute. You have the function button. Now this is an awesome button. The function button is your friend. And when you press the function button, it'll bring up a little menu. I'll show you in more detail in a moment when I turn the camera on, but it's basically a shortcut menu. That's what the function button does. And depending on what mode you're in, it'll change. Then below that, you have this navigation wheel. Now this navigation wheel spins and you can press it in. So it's four directions. You got an up, down, right, left, and you have a rotate. And then in the center, there's also a button. So you can press the center. Down here, you have a playback button, and then you have a garbage can button. So the, the garbage can button can be custom configured to whatever you want. By default, it is set to product showcase. Up here on the top, you have a C1 button, and that is set to clear and blurry, whatever you want to call that feature. Basically, it just makes the background blurry for you without having to know how cameras work. One other thing I just wanted to show you is how the screen turns out like this. It comes out and then it rotates around. So you can have the screen aiming like this. Let me just close that microphone door. You can have the screen aiming up like this if you want to get down close to the ground, or you can have it aimed like this if you have the camera over your head. Super convenient. And when you're in selfie mode, you could aim it forward like that. So you're looking at the screen while you're filming. So that's a super nice feature and the flippy screen is definitely highly welcomed. Now, while we're looking at the front of the camera here, let me just show you up here, you have a tally light right there. That little circle will light up red when you are recording video. Also down here, there's a button. That button is so you can release the lens. So if you press that button down and rotate the lens, it will come off and that is your sensor there. You always wanna make sure that that's covered though. You don't wanna hang out. You don't wanna leave your camera laying around with nothing covering that. You can put the E-mount cover on there if you want, or you can just mount a lens. So I recommend mounting a lens. And in order to do that, all the lenses, when you mount them, will have like a white dot or a red dot, and you can see the white dot right there. Now notice there's a white dot on the mount of the camera, the E-mount bayonet. This is called the lens bayonet. So you just line up the white dots like so, and then you can just rotate the lens and you'll hear it click. That click is this mechanism right here. There's like a pin and that pin actually comes out. You can see it moving right there. That's what's locking the lens on. Now you also have a pinch style lens cap. Take that guy off and then you can see the front of the lens element. Now this kit lens is a 40.5 millimeter thread. So if you wanted to get filters for the front of this, which I do recommend, you have ND filters, polarizer filters, and UV filters. A UV filter is a clear glass one, and you can use that to help protect the front of your lens. And I recommend getting one because you can see that glass is really close to the front, pretty easy to scratch, and there's no lens hood here to protect the glass like on most other lenses. So I do recommend getting a UV filter at the very minimum. I also recommend getting a variable ND filter that will help you maintain proper shutter speeds when you're recording video. Also on the lens here, while I'm looking at it, this is the power zoom slider. 
So you can use this rocker here to zoom the lens in and out. Let's turn this beast on and I'll show you how it works. All right, so here we are looking at the back of the camera. I just turned it on by sliding the toggle switch on the top to the on position. This is what you get prompted with. So you gotta select your language first. I'm gonna select English. And then we gotta enter the area, date, and time. And this is how you navigate this camera. Up, down, left, right, and then the center button is basically the enter button. So you can turn the wheel to scroll through stuff like this. You see if I turn the wheel, how it's moving? Or you can just use the navigation, left and right, all different ways. You can go up and down. It depends on what menu screen you're in, but you'll see on the bottom how it shows you the navigation. Left, right, up, down, enter, menu is to cancel. So the, that's how the, this camera works. When you're in any menu system, this is how you navigate using this navigation wheel. So let's go in there and daylight savings time. I like to leave that set to off. Now when we go to date and time, you're gonna go in there and set that and that is important to set correctly. All right, so today is September 26th and it's 2021 and it is 8.55. All right, I gotta go to the other eight because it's, I would need AM. 8.55 and then I'm just gonna hit the center button and that's it, it's all set up. Enter again and now it's telling you about this app, the Imaging Edge app. I have videos on this if you wanna learn how to use it. I'm just gonna click OK and there we have it. So now the camera just turned on and this is what it looks like by default. So what I'm gonna do is I don't want the camera moving around constantly while I'm talking. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this on a little mini tripod and then the camera won't be moving and it'll be much, you know, the video won't be so herky-jerky. So here's a little tripod plate and I'm just gonna show you how you mount that to the bottom of the camera. And guys, don't forget, you can just skip ahead if you want. You don't have to uh, watch all this. Below the video, there's navigation links and you can check those navigation links out if you want and just skip past this beginner type stuff if, if, it's, if you're not interested in it. All right, I'm just gonna tighten this up like a quarter, like so. All right, so that's good to go. Get the tripod set up here. All right, so here we are. We're all set up on the tripod now, and I have my little lab scene set up here just to show you, you know, how this camera works in a real environment. And first thing I wanna go, go over though is the screen. Now you can see there's a lot of information on the screen and you can change that by hitting the display button on the back of the camera, the one that says DISP. And if you press that, you'll see the screen will change the way it looks. Check that out. I'm just keep pressing it. This one is the one with the histogram. So you'll see the histogram on there. And the histogram is just showing you light modes and stuff like that. And now this one will show you the aperture and shutter speed. And this one will give you a little bit of info on the sides and on the top as well. So you can see here on the top left, you have the mode. This is showing you what mode you're in. So right now it is in video mode and it's set to auto video mode. Now here you have the memory card information. So that'll tell you you got two hours and 30 minutes left. Up here, it's telling you the recording format. It's set to HD at 60p right now. On the top right, it has the battery life information. Below that, you see that little thing with the hand. That's letting you know that image stabilization or optical stabilization in this case is turned on. And also notice this little green guy there. See that little green thing? That is a symbol letting you know that the camera knows that it's on a tripod. You see how it shows the little tripod underneath the camera? So it's automatically gonna adjust for that. So at this point, you can zoom in and out by using the lever, as you can see here. And notice the little IAF popping up. You see the little square on the I? That's IAF. And by default, it is set up to work. Also by default over here, you have the face smoothing. See the skin smoothing there? It's set to middle or medium, and that is on by default. And also face autofocus is on by default, as you can see here. Notice the face AF on. And down below here, you have shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. All right, so you can zoom in and out like so. I can hit the record button by pressing this button, and now it's recording video. And you can see this square that comes around to let you know it's recording. And then on the front, it has that tally light as well that's lit up right now because I'm recording video. And you can zoom in and out while you record. And this lens does make a little bit of noise when it zooms, so you will hear it when you're recording the audio. 
Um, they do make other lenses that are quieter though, like the 18 to 105 millimeter F4G OSS lens. That's a great lens. It's a lot heavier and a lot larger, but it is very quiet when you're zooming in and out recording video. All right, so let me stop recording there. And that's how that works. Now watch when I hit the mode button here. It just switched to S and Q mode, as you can see on the top left, that's telling you the mode that you're in, S and Q. So that's where we're at now. And it's set for right here, you can see it's HD 30P. So it's set to 120 frames per second. Microphone is off. So that'll give you four times slow motion. So this is a great feature for slow motion. And I will show you how to set that up in a moment because right now it's not set up optimal for how I would like it, but it is set up by default for slow motion, which is pretty sweet. And now if you press the mode button one more time, it's going to switch to photography mode. So now instead of a video camera, it looks more like a photography camera icon up there as you can see on the top left. All right. So now that we're in photo mode, if you press the shutter button, it will focus. And you could see it's by default focusing on the eye again because facial recognition is turned on. So it is prioritizing that face and eye, but by default, it will focus on whatever's closest to the camera, assuming it's not too close. If it's too close, it won't focus because every lens has a minimum focus distance, but whatever's closest to the camera by default is what the camera will try to focus on unless there is a face in the scene, then it will prioritize the face. So that's what we're doing here. It's prioritizing the face. And if I just press this shutter down halfway, it will focus. If I press it all the way, it will take the photo. And that's how you have it. And because it's in full auto mode, it's going to select all these settings for you. So right now it's, it actually has a little picture of a baby there because it thinks I'm taking a close up of a human. And that's the little, like taking a picture of a baby icon, I guess, up there on the top left. However, if you go into the function menu, remember I was telling you about the function menu? If you click that, this is that shortcut menu I was telling you about earlier. And depending on what mode you're in, this menu will change. For example, let me change it to video mode and I will hit the function button again. Notice when I hit video mode, it cropped in. So now I'm closer to the subject and also some of the options have changed. Now, if I hit the function button, now I have different options in the menu here. I have active stabilization is the bottom button there. You have the mic volume, which is this up here. It says level 26. And then you have the skin smoothing feature product showcase up there. And then the video mode that you're using is on the lower right here. So I could actually scroll in. Let me just scroll down and turn active steady shot off or put it to standard. You see how it zooms in like that? Look at that. So when you have it set to standard mode, it's only going to use the stabilization that the lens offers. So the lens has optical stabilization built in. That's what standard mode is. It'll use just optical stabilization. If you put it on active stabilization, it'll actually use digital stabilization as well. So in order to do that, it has to zoom in a little bit to give it that extra room on the sensor so it can accommodate for stabilization. And, but what the problem, the down side of that is you, it crops in on your subject a lot. And if you're standing in front of the camera, it might, your face might be too big in the scene because of that crop. So you can switch it to standard mode and that will give you what the lens actually is without that digital stabilization, or you can just turn it off. If you're using a tripod in a studio environment, you can just turn this feature off. You don't even need to use it if you're using a tripod. So for the time being, I'm just going to leave it on standard mode because I don't like this cropping effect. So I'm going to put it to standard mode for now. And then if I hit the function button again, let me just show you what this over here does. See this shoot mode option. If you click on that, these are all the different shoot modes on the left hand side. They're a little bit hard to see because of that, the picture on the screen there, but you have all these different exposure shoot modes. So you have manual exposure, shutter priority, and it'll give you like a description of what that mode does. Aperture priority and program auto. So I normally use manual mode for all my purposes, but that's a more advanced way to use it. So I'm not going to show you that in this particular video, but I want to make you aware that that is there. So if you're totally hundred percent new and you don't really know what you're doing with the camera settings, I recommend leaving it on intelligent auto mode for now. You could always go to program auto, which is still in auto mode, but it gives you way more power as far as what features you want to change 
in the camera. So once you're comfortable with Intelligent Auto, I would recommend trying Program Auto next. And then when you get more comfortable, you could move on to Aperture, Shutter Speed, and Manual Mode. So now, again, let me switch to Photography Mode. And if I hit the Function button, we have a bunch of features in here. You got Product Showcase, and you got Drive Mode and steady shot you can turn that on and off as well if i go into drive mode all i got to do again i'm navigating with this pad on the back like i showed you in the beginning if i just hit enter and go into drive mode here's the different drive modes so what the purpose of this feature is um, if you just want to take one shot like this it'll just take one shot but if i go back in there and i change it to continuous shooting, high, see how it's set to high? Notice how there's these little arrows on the left and the right. If you go left and right on the navigation pad, you can change this feature. And a lot of features on this camera work this way. If you see those little arrows, that means you have more features to the left and the right. So if I set it to high plus, that is the fastest shooting mode that it has. So watch this. You hear that? Super fast, and that's what continuous shooting is. Now this is a great feature if you're trying to capture sports, high-speed moving subjects, things like that, or you know portraits even. If your subject is moving all over the place, little kids and stuff, you can change this to like medium and then when you're taking portraits you just hold the button down, the shutter button, and it'll shoot like that. Now this is how I usually set the camera if I'm taking pictures of my kids and stuff because they're always moving, eyes are opening and closing and stuff like that. So medium Continuous shooting mode is a good way to go if you're taking portraits of kids or, or even people in my opinion And you can get to that by going to the function menu You can also get to that feature just by hitting the left side of this directional pad That's default for drive mode. So if you hit the left side of the pad, that'll bring you right into drive modes Now the other drive modes you have are self timer this is if you're gonna take a picture of yourself in front of the camera and you need to hit the button and then run around and get in front of the camera. This will give you 10 seconds to do that. But notice, you can actually change that by going left and right. You got the five second and the two second. Now, where you would want the two second, so you have the camera on a tripod and you want like absolutely no shake. So you would set the camera to two second self timer, hit the button, and then you, that will ensure that the camera is perfectly still. So if you're taking longer exposures and you like press the button, that will move the camera and the tripod will shake just a little bit. So that two second self timer will let the tripod and camera rig settle for two seconds after you hit the button. And that'll ensure that you get like super tack sharp shots. So I use self timer all the time when I'm taking longer exposures. So that is just basic function of how this camera works in photography mode and in video mode. And you just hit this button to change those modes. Let me show you what the clear and far does. So if I zoom in to this subject here, you see how the background is blurry and the foreground subject is super sharp. Now watch what happens when I hit this C1 button. It switched background defocus and that's what it's set to right now. I just turned that mode on. So I'm gonna click it one more time and now it's set to background defocus clear. And what it should have done is sharpened the background. And it did sharpen it up a little bit you could see if I press the shutter down halfway, it'll show you what the aperture is. See how it's F11 there? So it stopped it down to try to make the background more sharp. If I hit this again, now it's in defocus mode. Watch what happens when I press the shutter. See how the aperture is at F5.6? That's a wide open aperture. So that's making the background as blurry as it could possibly be. Now, if I press it again, like I said, you could see it sharpen up a little bit, but it's still a little bit out of focus just because of how close I am to the subject. If I zoom out a little bit, the background will sharpen up a little more. You can see now the background looks fairly clear. If I press this, you could see the background went out of focus a little bit. So let me just take a picture and I'll show you these two pictures. So that's the out of focus one. This is the clear one. So I'll show you those two pictures side by side so you can see the difference. And it's a really cool feature and you just press that button and uh, it works great. So in order to get out of the clear and defocus mode, you see how it tells you if you hit the mode button, it'll clear this feature. So right now this feature is enabled. So if I hit this button here, 
like the menu says, it'll turn that feature off. So now that feature is off. So I'm not using the defocus or the clear option anymore. That feature has been disabled. So that's how you disable that. Now, if you hit the garbage can button, remember that's the product showcase button. So now product showcase is set to on. Now take a look here. I want to show you this. See this facial recognition icon there? Watch what happens when I turn product showcase on and off. You see how the facial recognition is turning on and off? That's all product showcase does. So now if I focus, it's still going to focus on the face because that's the closest thing to the camera. But it, notice how the IAF is not coming up. See how that's not coming up anymore? It's just focusing on what's ever closest to the camera. So if I put something out there, like this lens, for example, even though the face is in the scene, it's going to focus on the lens. Now watch when I turn that feature off. See how it immediately focuses on the face? And you can see that's because the facial recognition is turning back on. Check that out. Watch this. I'll turn it off again, and it focuses on the lens. Turn it on, focuses on the face. So that's what Product Showcase does. It basically just turns on and off facial recognition. And it's just a quick way to do it by hitting a button. Before we get into the menu system, I just want to show you a couple more things. Let's say we're taking a picture like this, and we don't want to focus on the face. We want to focus on the walkie-talkie to the right. So the easiest way to do that is to just touch the walkie-talkie on the screen. And look at that. The focus just shifted to the walkie-talkie. Isn't that incredible? And you can do that anywhere. You just touch around the screen and the focus will shift. Now watch what happens when I switch to video mode. All right, so now it's in video mode and it's focused on the face again. So watch what happens when I hit, and notice how the IAF is working in video mode. You see the little square there? Now watch what happens when I hit record. It's focused on the face. Now watch, while recording, I can just touch anywhere and the focus will switch. Like that is absolutely incredible power. And that's one of the reasons why this camera is so awesome. To cancel tracking, you can actually hit that little button up top there, which is like a little tracking icon with an X, or you can hit the center button on the back of the camera and that will cancel it. Notice how it says cancel tracking and then it'll put it back to the given focus mode, which in this case is zone focus mode. You could see that bracket there, the square bracket. Now, one other thing I wanted to show you, if you go into the function menu and you click on this microphone, this is where you set your levels. Now, by default, you would want your levels to be somewhere around 12 uh, as a good rule of thumb. So if you lower that a little bit, you could see right there is pretty good. Nothing's clipping in this environment. Right around there is where I would have it set. So that's how you adjust your audio when recording video. And I'm actually still recording right now, so I was able to make those adjustments while recording. Pretty cool. Some features you can do while you're recording and not while you're recording. Product showcase, you can't turn that on and off while recording. You have to do that beforehand. Product defocus, you can change while recording, however. All right, so one other thing I want to show you before we go into the menu system is the playback area. So if you hit the playback button on the bottom of the camera here, That'll bring you into the playback area. Now here you can view your photos and videos and you could navigate by turning the thumb wheel like so. So I'm just scrolling through the stuff I just took and notice here how it's like a stack of images. That's when I had it in continuous shooting mode when it was like rapid firing. It just puts those images in a stack for you so you don't have to go through like hundreds of images. And now if you want to play back your video, you just hit the center button. And you can see right here on the bottom, it's telling you, you got the volume. If you hit down, you can change the volume. Play is this button. And now, it's recording and now the video is playing. And you can see here on the bottom, this is how you navigate. So you can fast forward and so forth. And another thing I want to show you, if I go to a photo here, here's a photo. So when I hit the zoom lever, it automatically, if you zoom in, it automatically zooms into 100%. And then you can just back off if you want to check your focus, and then you could move around the screen by navigating with the rear wheel. This is great for checking eye focus. Uh, make sure the eyes are sharp, and you can see how blurry the background is there. Stuff like that. And if you keep zooming out, it'll actually go to a thumbnail style where you can actually navigate much quicker. And then if you zoom out another time, it'll go into a date format, 
which is really cool. So if you're on vacation or something, you can go to the day you're at Epcot Center and just look at those photos. And uh, you could navigate all that by just zooming in and out. And notice here on the left-hand side, you could navigate as to what file type you're looking for if you want. So you can also change that stuff. If you scroll over here, you can scroll down and it'll just show photos, just show video and so forth. So I'm just gonna go back over here and I'll hit the zoom in. And now I'm at the photos I took the other day. Zoom in again. Now I'm looking at the photo. Zoom in again. Now I'm looking at 100% of that photo. So that's how you would navigate the playback menu. And again, you can just scroll using this wheel as well. Notice how you can zoom in and out with this wheel. And if you zoom back one more, now you can scroll and go through the different images and video clips. So that's how that works in the playback menu. All right, guys, so I'm just going to hit the menu button here. And notice I am in video mode right now. So I'm gonna hit the menu. And one thing you need to understand about Sony cameras is that depending on what mode you're in, certain features in the menu system will be grayed out or not accessible. So in this case, I'm in video mode, so it's not allowing me to change the photography file format settings. Notice how they're grayed out. And uh, that's just because I'm in video mode. So if I switch modes, so now, now I'm in photography mode, and I go to menu, now I can change those settings. See that? So that's one concept you really need to understand. And if something's grayed out, it's because you're in the wrong mode or you're in the wrong file format, for example. Let's go over photography mode first. So here what we're looking at is JPEG. Now that is just the file format that the camera is gonna save your file in. You can change that to RAW and JPEG and or just have it at, set to RAW. RAW will give you a higher quality image, but it does require you to edit it in post-processing. Um, I generally shoot in RAW quality almost all the time because I prefer editing my photos in Lightroom after the fact. But if you want the camera to do all the work for you and process the images for you, I would recommend leaving it in JPEG mode. And if you're new to photography and a beginner, I would recommend leaving it in JPEG mode for now. And once you get to the point where you want to start getting more out of your photos and you want to start processing them yourself, you can switch over to RAW and then go into post-processing and stuff like that. Now, JPEG quality, you can change that to fine, extra fine. For the best quality possible, I recommend putting it on extra fine. JPEG size, you can change the size of the file. If you don't need that full 24 megapixel file, and you just need 12 megapixel, which is a lot, 12 megapixel is still a lot, you can switch that and save a ton of room on your memory card. This is great if you're just taking like hundreds and hundreds of photos and you just don't need that high resolution. Aspect ratio, this is where you would go to change the shape of the file that you're taking, pretty much. So three by two is a four by six format. Four by three is more of an eight by 10 style frame. 16 by 9 is a more of that long cinematic rectangle frame and then one to one is a square So if you want a square photo, you can switch it there to that I like to leave it at 3 to 2 myself and I change that format uh, In post-processing if I want to crop it now if we go to the right We got a couple other features here Like I said a lot of this stuff is grayed out because we're in full auto mode. All right, so Color space, you can change that to Adobe RGB if you want, depending on your workflow. Kind of more of an advanced feature. Lens compensation, I recommend leaving this on auto. It'll help correct for issues with certain lenses and stuff automatically for you. Now on the next page here, now we're on page three, we have shoot mode and a couple other options here. So it's set to intelligent auto. I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna change that to program auto. And now program auto, as you can see, looking at the screen, I have a lot more stuff. If you just look over here on the right hand side, I have DRO auto, standard, I have picture modes here. That's what that icon is. And on the bottom, it's showing you that if you turn these wheels, you can change settings. So if I turn the wheel on the top, notice how the settings are changing. So I'm changing the aperture and shutter speed here by turning this wheel. So when you're in program auto, it gives you that power. If I just press the shutter button, it'll bring you back. So now if I go into the menu and I'm in program auto now, you can see my mode changed. If I go back, look at how these features are no longer grayed out. Now I can go in here and turn on and off long exposure noise reduction, for example. By the way, if you're taking pictures of stars and astrophotography, you definitely want to turn this off. Otherwise, you could probably leave it on. 
and then here's just the power of the noise reduction and so forth. And if I go back here, here's more file modes and notice how panorama and stuff is still grayed out. That is because I'm not in panorama mode. So check this out. If I go back to shoot mode and click that, if I scroll down, I can change the camera to panorama mode. See that sweep panorama. All right. So let me change it to sweep panorama. And now the camera is set up in panorama mode and you can see it shows an arrow and it's grayed out on this side. And pretty much what you do is you just point the camera and you start shooting and you have to turn the camera as you're shooting and it'll create a panorama for you inside the camera, which is amazing. And that's how that feature works. But let me just show you another option here. If you go into the shoot mode, if you scroll down here, this is your scene mode options and notice those little triangles. Remember how I told you a lot of these features have triangles on the left and the right. If you go to the left and the right, you can change your scene mode. Now this is an excellent tool for somebody new to photography. So if you don't know what settings you want on your camera, but you do know what scene you're shooting in, go to the scene modes here and you can select the, your scene. If you're taking a portrait, set the camera to portrait scene mode right here in this menu. And that's how you can get the best possible quality portrait. If you don't know how to use the camera in more advanced modes, sports, if you're taking sports photos, set the scene to sports mode. Macro, set the scene to macro. This is a really, really awesome tool, guys, and I highly recommend you check it out using scene modes. Great for beginners. You just select what scene you're currently shooting under, and the camera will do all the settings for you, and it'll get you killer results almost every single time. Of course, knowing how to manually control all the settings yourself is the best way to go, but if you're a beginner, that can take you years to learn all those things. So utilizing these tools is a really, really good way to go. And I highly recommend checking them out in particular, this scene mode feature. Don't think you're stupid. No one's going to make fun of you for doing this. This is a tool that the camera provides you use it and you will get better shots. That's what scene mode does. Now, if you hit menu, that'll bring you back. So I'm just going to change this mode back to program auto like so. And just so you're aware, this is aperture priority mode, shutter priority mode, and manual mode. This is memory recall mode where you can set the camera up to specific settings and then recall them at any given time. So I'm just gonna put it back to P mode here, uh, program auto, because I wanna show you the settings in the menu and a lot of them are grayed out when you're in full auto mode. So let me go into the menu and here we are back in the shoot mode area. So remember, you have the drive mode. That's where you can set to continuous shooting. Like I showed you earlier and you got self timer, which is what I have it set to single shooting, continuous shooting, self timer. This is self timer continuous. So it'll actually take three images at the end of 10 seconds. This is a cool feature, especially if you're taking like a family portrait or stuff because you know, somebody's eyes are going to be closed. So this will actually take three shots instead of just one. So you can just use the regular self timer. It'll take one shot or you can use this feature and it'll fire off three shots when the timer runs out. Bracketing. This feature is great for taking multiple exposures at the same time, pretty much. It'll just take three shots in a row at different exposure values and it's called bracketing. I use this feature for HDR photography and I use it all the time. How I like to set it is two EVs and three images. So when you take the photo, It'll actually take three shots at three different exposures. And that's how I, ha I like to have that set. If you're interested in HDR photography, be sure to check out my HDR photography video tutorial, and it'll go over all these details in much more in depth. And down here, you just have other bracketing settings. This is a single bracket. Then you have a white balance bracket and you have a dynamic range optimizer bracket and uh, you can play around with those. White balance is good if you're not sure and you're trying to get skin tones more accurate, you can actually spread the white balance a little bit. And the white balance, by the way, is the, the way that the camera figures out what colors are what, and it wants to make sure that white is white and not yellow or blue. And white balance is basically a factor of temperature, color temperature. I'll show you more about that in a moment. So if I go back into the menu here, um, that's drive mode, bracket settings, interval shooting, is time-lapse photography. And if you click this, you can set the camera up so it will interval shoot. You have to turn it on and off. And by default, it's off. And if you go in there, you can actually set the camera up to how many time, how long it's gonna take, how many seconds in between shots, 
the number of shots it's going to take, and also the auto exposure tracking sensitivity. You can change that, which is great for sunsets and things like that. And that's how you would go about doing interval shooting. You can also set the camera for silent shooting in interval, which it is on by default, and shoot interval priority. Um, that will basically control, depending on how you have your camera set, uh, as far as long shutter speeds and stuff like that, this will control those types of things. By the way, when you're in the menu system, if you don't know what something is, if you hit the garbage can button, it'll actually give you a description as to what that function means. It's not always the greatest explanation, but this it'll tell you. Sets whether or not it'll automatically adjust the shutter speed, prioritizing shooting intervals when the exposure mode is in program auto or aperture priority. So it gives you a nice description of what that does. Now, if I just hit menu, that'll bring me back. Now, memory recall, this is where you can go in and set the camera up how you like it and save those settings. And this is where you can recall those settings. You can have up to four of them. As you see up there, one, it's got one, then M1, M2, M3, and M4. And uh, it's a pretty cool feature for more advanced users that like to have the camera set up specifically in a variety of ways. And this is an easy way to switch between those camera settings because it can be a pain in the butt going through and changing all sorts of settings if you want to use the camera in a different mode. And that memory recall feature uh, helps with that tremendously as far as saving time and stuff. Now, remember, I am in program auto mode. So if I go to the right one more time, now I'm on page four. This is where you have focus mode. And if I go in there, you can change that. You have single shot AF, which is what I tend to use for photography most of the time. Then you have automatic AF, which will switch between AFC and AFS. AFC is continuous autofocus mode. Continuous autofocus mode is what you want to use if you have moving subjects or if you're recording video. So if you're recording a moving subject, autofocus continuous will constantly track the subject. So let me show you what I mean. Because I want to select AFC right now, it won't let me select it. And the reason it won't is because I have self timer on. See that self timer? So you can't do continuous autofocus and self timer. So let me change that to single shot, and then I will go back into the menu, go to focus mode. Now look, now I can change it to AFC, you see? So that is one of the most confusing things about the Sony cameras, how stuff is grayed out sometimes and you don't know why. And it's because it depends on what mode you're in and what feature you're using that determines what's grayed out and what's not grayed out. So now I can have the camera set to continuous autofocus. And if this subject, if, all you gotta do is press the shutter down and hold it halfway. And you can see how it's tracking that face. That's continuous autofocus. And again, you could just touch the screen as well, and now it's touching, and I don't have to hold the shutter down. Now it's just touch tracking the subject, which is pretty awesome. So that's how autofocus continuous works. Now, remember, I'm in program auto mode, so now if I hit the function button, notice how I have all these other features in here now. Remember that, that there was very few in there when I was in the other mode. So now I have the option to change the focus mode within the function menu. So I'm just gonna switch that back to AFA. Now AFA will switch between AFC, continuous, and AFS, which is single shot. So AFA is a good spot if you want the camera to automatically detect if your subject's moving. So if I start moving this around, the camera will automatically switch to AFC, watch. See how it's tracking the subject? So it's in AFC mode right now even though it says it's in AFA mode, because AFA, remember, is both continuous and single, depending on what the camera sees. The camera's extremely intelligent, and uh, it will automatically switch between those modes. So that's a really cool feature. All right, so if you go into the function menu here, and you hit the ISO button, now it's there because I'm in program auto mode. It wasn't an option before when I was in intelligent auto or full auto mode. So you can see there it says P for program auto. That, and that's why I have all these other features. So ISO is the camera sensitivity, and that's right here. So it's set to auto right now, but notice there's an arrow. Whenever you see an arrow, that means you can do more. So if I hit the right top, the right side of the navigation wheel, it brings me over to the right. So now I can control my maximum and minimum amount. See that? 
So I can change my minimum ISO here and I can change my maximum ISO. So I can raise this up to like 12,800, for example. Now you might not wanna do that, but that's where you would change that. So now when I'm using auto ISO, it will have that range available to it. Now you could lower that down and that will severely you know, limit the amount of ISO that the camera has when in auto mode. Or you can go down and hard set your ISO. So you can set it to like ISO 100, for example, or you can dial it into whatever number you want. This is where you would change that option. And remember, ISO is the camera sensor sensitivity. The higher this number, the more noise that's gonna be introduced to your photos or videos. So the higher the sensitivity, the more noise. The lower the number, the less noise. 100 is the lowest noise you're gonna get. You're not gonna notice any difference between 50 and all these numbers. 100 is pretty much as clean as the image is, is gonna look. And you'll start to notice noise, by the way, right around about 800 is when it'll start creeping in. But you could use 1600 even, and it'll, it'll look really good. When you get up to 3200, you're gonna start to see a little bit of grain in your footage and your photos for sure. But right now I'm just gonna leave it at auto for now. All right, so I'm gonna go back into the function menu and I wanna show you this other feature. It's called white balance. Now white balance is what keeps track of what colors are what. And right now the camera is set to auto white balance. But watch what happens when I change that. Notice how the color, the tint of the scene is changing because I have it set to sun. Now it's set to sun mode. And if I scroll down, now it's set to shade. Here's cloudy, here's incandescent light. So you can see the color temperature is what's changing and it's going from cool to warm. And that's pretty much what light does. Light has color, a color temperature associated with it. And if you scroll through here, there's all these different options. Auto, auto white balance for underwater. White balance by temperature. This is the feature that I use most when in a studio environment. And this is why I wanted to show you this. Because when you buy a studio light, a decent light will have a color temperature option. And they all have color temperatures associated with them. So the lighting that I'm using right now for this scene that we're in right here, I have the light set to 5000. So I'm using two light sources on both sides of the camera here, and they're configured to 5000 Kelvin. So that right there would be the most accurate white balance color based on the scene I have set up right now. So that's how white balance works. It's very important that you have white balance set correctly when you're recording video. If you have your white balance set to auto, like this, notice how the color is different than when I had it set to 5000. So the camera's trying its best, it's doing a good job. Auto white balance works great. But where it becomes an issue that I notice in particular when using auto white balance is when you put something in front of the camera like this and it takes up a large portion of the screen, the white balance might shift and it might turn the scene like a, a hint of green or a hint of magenta. But if you have it hard set to a number, it will not fluctuate no matter what you put in front of the screen. Like if I put my hand in front of the screen, it only has my hand to figure out what color temperature it should be. It doesn't have like all the information from the background anymore. So this is why the camera might guess wrong. And this is why you really wanna change it and hard set it when you're recording video. Um, and definitely when you're taking photos as well, you really wanna change that to what lighting condition you are in. All right, so I'm gonna go back into the menu system here and I'm gonna show you focus area. If you click the button here, it'll bring you in and you have wide focus area. Basically what the focus area is, is how much of the sensor is gonna be used for autofocus purposes. So right now, the entire sensor is being used when you're set to wide focus area. So if I focus right now, it can focus on anything all the way over to here. See how it's focusing on the face all the way in the corner? Watch what happens when I go into focus mode. By the way, you can get to that in the function menu as well. If you hit the function button, you can go up here and notice how focus area is there. Like I said, the function menu is a cool shortcut to some of the key features depending on what mode you're in. All right, so zone focus is what the camera was set to. Now notice that zone, see how all the, it's a grid? You can move that around wherever you want. It's an awesome feature. So I'm just gonna put it over here to the right for now. So now the camera is only gonna focus on stuff within that, that rectangle area. See how it's not focusing on the face anymore, even though it's in the scene? Now watch, once I put that within that focus area, now it's focusing on the face. But if I go over here, it's not. Focus area controls where the camera can focus, like where the autofocus will work 
And that's what that feature does. It's extremely powerful and it's very, very helpful if you're trying to limit the focus to a particular area in your scene. Another option is this flexible spot. Now check this out. The flexible spot is just this little square. So you can move that around and it will limit the focus to just that tiny little area. Now this is a great feature to use if you're trying to track something small or you just want to focus on something very small in the scene. Like my, let's say there's like a little rock, you're, you're at the beach and there's like a shell and you want the shell, just the shell to be sharp. You could move that focus point just to that area and then the camera will focus on just that area. You could take the shot and be good to go. But I never use this feature. And the reason is because you could just touch where you want it to focus at any time. You just touch around the screen and it will focus. So I never use that, that feature anymore, but it is there. So I just got to cancel touch operation. So cancel touch operation by hitting this center button. And then I can go back into the function menu and I can change that focus area back to zone. I tend to use zone most often for what I'm recording in front of the camera um, because I don't want the camera focusing on anything outside of that, that like square area. So I usually have the camera set to this when I'm recording in front of the camera in the studio environment. So let me go back into the menu system. So focus area limit. This is all the focus area features. Now you can go in here and enable all these, but they're off by default. So you have all these flexible spot options. Large was there, but you also have these smaller sizes. See that? So you can turn these smaller sizes on and you'll get a smaller flexible spot if you want that. Um, and then you have over here, expand flexible spot is a great feature. If you want to track moving subjects, that's a really good feature to use. You can turn that on right here and then that will appear in your focus area options. Right now, the focus area is very limited though. You can see a lot of these checks are off. And for the, to be honest with you, the touch to focus kind of replaced a lot of these. So you don't really need to use them, especially with the touch to tracking options. But that's what that feature is. And you can turn them on and off to get more focus area options if you need them. Now, face IAF set, if you go in there, this is where you can turn your facial recognition on and off. But remember, the product showcase button, which is the trash can here, will also turn this on and off for you. But if you go in here, you can turn it on and off manually and subject detection. Now this is critical. If you click on subject detection, this is where you change the camera from human to animal. So if you're recording videos of your cat, dog, bird, pet, whatever, you're going to want to change it to animal mode and then the IAF will work. So that's where that option is. You might need to change that. And you can also change which eye you want it to focus on, turn the display on and off. I like having it on so you can see that square pop up, like that frame that pops up over the subject. Like you see that square there? That's what it's talking about in the menu and that little square for the eye. I like having that turned on because it just, it helps clarify that the eye is gonna be sharp when you take the shot. So autofocus with shutter, that's turned on. That feature is basically when you just press this halfway, it autofocuses. So that's what that does. You can turn that off though. Pre-AF, pre-AF is for the most part what that does. The camera will automatically autofocus for you even before you hit the shutter button to make it autofocus. So if you just put something in front of the scene, the camera will automatically switch to that by default, even if you don't tell it to refocus. Now you can turn pre-AF on and off if you want. Like if you don't like the camera doing that, turn this off, save you a little battery life. But I actually do like that feature, so I tend to leave it on. Now going to the right, you have focus frame color. By default, it's set to white, but you can change that. Autofocus area, auto clear. This is a more advanced feature I'm not gonna cover in this video. Continuous autofocus, that's by default on, and that'll bring those green dots up when it's tracking something, so you know that it's actually tracking it. I would recommend leaving that on. Autofocus micro adjust, this is a feature if you have a lens where the focus is off, you can adjust it a little bit in there. Next page, we have exposure. Now this is your exposure compensation. So remember, when I hit the button on the bottom before, on the bottom of this wheel, that's the exposure compensation button. It didn't work before when we were in full auto mode, but when we press it now, you can see the exposure comp coming up and you can turn the wheel right and left to compensate the exposure. So notice at plus two, it's overexposing the image to full stops. 
and you can see that right there, plus one. Zero is a correct exposure in general, but sometimes you wanna adjust that. Like sometimes you might have something really bright in the scene and you wanna underexpose it a little bit to make sure that that bright object doesn't blow out. You know, like a wedding dress, for example. And then if you're in the snow, um, because the conditions are so bright, the camera will automatically underexpose the scene, which will yield you like gray looking snow. So if you're in snow, you're gonna wanna set the exposure comp to like plus 1.5, 1.7 area, even even plus two. And that'll make sure that the snow looks white and the exposure is correct for that environment. So that is what the purpose of exposure compensation is. And you can get to it by hitting the bottom of the thumb pad as long as you're not in full auto mode. You have to be in program auto mode or other more advanced modes in order to get to that feature. So here's ISO. I already covered that. That's the camera sensitivity. Now metering mode. This feature is pretty cool because this will tell the camera how to expose the scene. So right now it's using the entire scene to figure out what the proper exposure is. So if I change that to center priority, it's only gonna prioritize the center of the scene. And if I set it to spot mode, it's only going to use a very, very small portion of the scene to do the metering. And that's what metering mode does. You also have the entire screen average and you have highlight mode. Highlight mode is awesome. I recommend checking out highlight mode, especially if you're taking pictures of like frothy water in the sun where that white froth is like blowing out. If you set the camera to highlight mode, it'll make sure that that bright water doesn't blow out or the bright wedding dress doesn't blow out. It'll make sure it maintains the highlights. So this is a great feature if you need to maintain the highlight detail. Now it will generally underexpose the image probably for the most part, but it will maintain the highlight detail. And when that matters, that's when you would use this feature. Like I said, guys, this camera is so powerful. And to really harness the power, you need to understand what these features are and how they work uh, to get the most out of it. So down here, you got face priority in multimetering. What that means is it will prioritize the face even if the background is like super bright. Like, so for example, if, if there was a sun or something behind the face, a backlit situation, the camera would still prioritize the face. And that's what that feature does. I just need to change my metering mode back to multi. I, I set it to a spot there. Exposure step, you can change that if you want. I would just leave that at default. Flash mode, you can change these settings if you get a flash. The flash would actually go into this hot shoe here. And once you plug that in, you can control flash mode features here. I'm not gonna go into that in this video though. White balance, I already went over that. That is set to auto. Priority set in auto white balance is set to standard. You can set it to all these other modes here. You got ambience and you got white. So it'll prioritize different lighting conditions uh, depending on what environment you're in. I tend to leave it on standard, however. Dynamic range optimizer and auto HDR, if you go in there, uh, by default, what that does is it'll automatically fill in the shadows a little bit for you and try to tone down the highlights. That's what auto does for dynamic range optimizer. You can turn that off if you want for shooting raw. And auto HDR is a really cool feature. If you click on auto HDR, you can go to the right and change the auto HDR values. You can set it to auto, one. I tend to use 4EV for auto HDR when, you're, when I'm using that mode. And what that'll do is it'll actually fire off multiple exposures and then combine those exposures on the camera to give you a more dynamic range fulfilled scene. So if you're in a scene with super bright highlights and super dark shadows, using auto HDR will yield you a pretty awesome result because it'll capture that highlight detail and the shadow detail and then bring that out in the final product. The only downside is you do have to be in JPEG mode. You can't do this in raw quality. Watch what happens when I take a photo in auto HDR. You see how it took the three shots and now it's processing. So now it's combining the three shots. And if you go in there, it actually takes two pictures. It takes one picture without the auto HDR, and then it takes another one with it. So you can see the one with auto HDR here. I know it's a small screen. Now if we're looking at creative style. So this is how you need to think about creative style. This is how the camera is gonna process your images. So you can change your creative style to vivid, portrait, landscape, sunset, black and white. There's all these different creative styles. And notice the arrow again, so you can go to the right and you can dial in these settings even more if you wish. 
So what a lot of times I like to do is I like to set it to vivid when I'm using auto HDR mode, for example, and it'll give you a little extra punch when you're taking landscape photos and stuff, but I tend to leave it on standard for the most part. That's what creative modes do. Picture effect is a more fun mode, I would say, to just play around and get interesting photos, such as toy camera, for example. Um, pop you got here, you got posterization, which is a pretty cool effect. You got retro, you got high key there, you got partial color. So partial color will just show you what color it's set to. So right now red, it's only showing you the reds. You can set it to green, you can set it to blue, yellow, so forth. High contrast black and white is an awesome picture effect. I really like that one. You got HDR painting is a pretty cool one. Miniature, also a very cool one. Watercolor produces some pretty cool results. Check this out. Let me do a watercolor. I'll show you what that looks like on in full size in a second. And then uh, let me go into the menu and I'll show you what illustration mode looks like. Illustration mode is one of my favorite. Actually, illustration mode is my favorite uh, picture effect mode for sure. And I'll show you what that looks like in full screen as well. So let me go back into the menu. That's what picture effects do. And again, you have to be in JPEG mode for picture effects to work. Now picture profile, this is more for video. You can use it in photo mode, but it's really for video. If you go in there, you have all these different picture profile modes. All right, so picture profiles, you have PP1 all the way to PP10. So as you can see on the list I have up on the screen, these are the S-Log modes and cinema modes that you would be using if you're a more advanced user and you really wanna grade your video um, in post-processing or if you're looking for a specific look, you could use these picture profile modes. I do not use these modes at this time. I just don't do it. I don't like grading the video in post-processing. It takes a lot of time and effort. And I find that having the camera set to creative style standard works really well. And as long as you have your white balance set correctly, the images and the video quality comes out excellent. And so that's why I don't use that mode, but a lot of users use picture profile. It's almost like shooting video in raw quality and it does it has a skill required and there's a learning curve and you would need to grade the video in, in post-processing to get the most dynamic range. So it does have an advantage when it comes to dynamic range and stuff. But again, for the most part in studio environment, I don't need to use it, so I don't. More advanced feature for sure. The soft skin effect, you can turn that on and off right here. Focus magnifier, let me show you how that works. So I'm gonna hit the function button, and I'm gonna go to focus mode, and I'm gonna switch it to manual focus. So now, if I try to focus by turning the focus ring here, you see how it's zoomed in there? That's what the focus zoom is, the magnify zoom it's automatically focusing and zooming in there for you. Pretty cool, right? So that's how you can ensure focus accuracy when you're using a manual focus lens or just using a lens in manual focus mode. Sometimes if you're taking macro shots, pictures of flowers and things like that, the camera just will not focus on what you want. It just focuses on the wrong spot. In those cases, you can go in there and just switch it to manual focus and then you can dial it in perfect and get it exactly where you want. That's what's so cool about using manual focus. And the other focus mode here is direct manual focus, DMF. Direct manual focus is cool because what you can do there is you can focus using autofocus and then you can fine tune it after the fact. So I have the focus button pressed and I'm still holding it and you could then fine tune it and take the shot. So that's what direct manual focus is. It still autofocuses, but it gives you the option to dial it in after the fact. Now let me go back into the menu here and I need to turn off auto HDR. I left that on by accident. I'm just gonna leave it on auto right here like that. So these are just another couple of features that refer to focus magnify, autofocus and focus magnify, manual focus assist on. That's that feature where you turn the lens, it automatically pops up. Peaking settings. Peaking is a feature that's good for manual focus users. And what it does is it'll tell you where the contrast is in the scene, which will help you manually focus. So let me show you how that works. If I turn that on and let me just switch the camera to manual focus again. So notice those that white that just popped up. Can you see the white on the, on the face? So when I zoom in, you can see those little white dots around the eyes. 
and that's focus peaking. So those little white dots are showing up, so I know right there is sharp. And uh, you could see when it zooms out, now you can see more of it on the hair and stuff. Those white dots, that's what focus peaking is. And you can change the color and stuff. See that? You got level and you got color. So if I change the color to like red or something, let me show you what it looks like now. You see the red? And if I go to adjust, you can see the red focus peaking showing up right there on the eye. So that's what focus peaking is. And this is another excellent tool that will help you yield the power of this camera when using manual focus, like a cinema lens and, or something like that. A lot of those lenses, they're all manual. Product showcase, you can turn that on and off here, but don't forget there's that button on the back for it. Face registration, you can actually register faces on this camera. And then once you register the face, like your kid, for example, you could then prioritize your kid's face. <laughs> like this is what this is so cool for. If your kid's like uh, posing or playing a sport, but, and you know, there's a bunch of kids there, you don't want, you want your kid to be sharp. So you can register your kid's face, set the priority to on for your kid's face. And then even if there's a couple of kids or a couple of people or whatever, the camera will prioritize the face that you tell it to. Super powerful feature and most people don't use it because they don't really know that it's there or what the purpose is but when you're trying to pose mo people and there's like people everywhere the camera with facial recognition is going to focus on the wrong face a lot of the time so your options are to turn off facial recognition and just focus on the particular face you want by like touching the screen on the face or you can register a face and go this route as well all right, so now I'm up here on the second tab. Now, another thing I wanted to show you guys real quick when navigating, if you just hit this function button, it goes through the tabs on the top, which is a nice little shortcut. Otherwise, you can go up and down. If you go up to the top, you could then move left and right as well. And then if you go down, you could navigate the pages. And you can see the pages right there as I'm scrolling through, but that function button will help you just skip through the tabs quickly if you need to. All right, so here we are in video mode now, and this is where the video options are, but they're grayed out. And the reason they're grayed out, remember, I'm in photo mode. So because I'm in photo mode, I can't change the video settings. So let me change the camera to video mode. There we go. Now the camera's in video mode. Let me go back to menu. Now I can change the video settings. So I can change the file format and the shoot mode. Right now it's an intelligent auto mode. This is where I recommend you guys leave it if you're brand new to the camera. For more advanced users, I would definitely recommend at least putting it on program auto mode so you can adjust the settings yourself and you have more power to turn certain things on and off. So right now I am in program auto mode for video. So now if I go down here, you got the USB streaming feature here, which is pretty cool There's a button for that. You have your file format. Now in here, I recommend changing it to 4K. 4K is the best quality and it's gonna yield you the sharpest, crispest shots. So now, now that it's in 4K, if you go down to record settings, this is the actual record setting that it's gonna format the file in. So I like to use 24p at 100 megabits per second. If you guys are not seeing these frame rates right here, that is because your camera is set to PAL mode. So I live in the United States, so the default for my camera is NTSC. If you live in Europe or overseas in European countries, your camera will be default PAL because the frame rates are different in different regions. So that's why your frame rate is gonna look different than mine. I'll show you where to change that right now. If you go back to the menu and hit the function button and you go into the setup area, if you scroll over right here, page two, NTSC slash PAL, this is where you would change your camera. If your camera is set to PAL mode, you would need to change it to NTSC uh, in order to have the same frame rates as mine. So this is where you would change that. So going back to file format, if I go back to HD here, and now I go to record setting, now look at all these frame rates I have. So depending on what record mode you're in, that will determine what kind of frame rate options you have. Now I got 60p at various bit rates, 30p, various bit rates, and 24p at 
50 megabits right there. And that's what I would use if I was just using regular HD 1080. Now 120 at 100 megabits, 120 is that frames per second that you use if you wanna get slow motion footage. But this is where you would go to change those frame rates. And uh, 120 would give you that slow motion footage if you bring it into post-processing. I have a video that'll show you how to do that. So if you wanna check that out, just look in my how-to videos and uh, how to create slow motion video. I'm just gonna hit menu and I'm gonna go back and set it to 4K and I'm gonna set it to 24P at 100 megabits per second. This is how I have my camera set whenever I'm recording in front of the camera, unless I'm doing slow motion stuff. Then I have it set to 120, but otherwise I have it set to 4K at those settings. Now S and Q settings. These are the other mode that's on the top of the camera, S and Q. Now this is how you can get slow motion video in camera. You can't do that with the 120 mode. 120 mode records and the video plays back at regular speed. You have to slow it down in post-processing. S and Q does that for you on the camera. So if you go in here, uh, record setting, it's set to 30p. I wanna change that to 24p because that's how I edit my videos. All my videos I use for YouTube, I use the 24p frame rate. So when I upload it to YouTube, it's at 24p. Now I'm gonna leave this at 120 frames per second, however, which is gonna yield me five times slow motion. So if I record video, it's gonna be five times slow motion by default recorded right on the camera, which is amazing. So that's how I'm gonna have my S and Q set up, like so. I'm just gonna hit menu and go back. Also note how the battery life is draining quite quick because the battery life on this camera sucks. It's really not that good and you're gonna to wanna to get a couple extra batteries. I know I mentioned that already. I've been recording for about an hour or so and you can see it's down to 21% already. So that's what we're looking at there. So moving on to the right, you have what's called proxy recording. Now proxy recording is a nice feature for those looking to have multiple video files. So you'll have your full resolution 4K file and then a lower resolution proxy file. And what that can help you with is it'll speed up your workflow process in post-processing if you use proxy video for your editing workflow. More of an advanced feature, but why you need to know about this is because if you have this turned on, your eye autofocus is not gonna work. You lose features when you have proxy recording turned on and the tracking, facial tracking, and object tracking and stuff, it doesn't work when you have proxy recording turned on. And that kind of sucks but it's good to know. So I, I don't use this, by the way. I never use proxy recording, but it can definitely speed up your workflow if you're a proxy user. Now, AF transition speed and AF shift sensitivity. This is a really important feature that you need to know about. So watch what AF transition speed does. It's set to fast by default. So when I'm recording video, like so, if you touch somewhere on the screen, it's gonna switch focus. So it just focused to the car in the background there. There, it focused to the car, now back to the face. So you see how quick it, tra it, it changed? It, it, the transition was fairly fast. So watch what happens when I change this transition speed. I'm gonna lower it down to three. All right, so now watch, watch what happens when I select the car in the background. You see how much slower it changes? much smoother and much slower. So I, I much prefer a slower transition speed like this than that fast choppy one. However, if you are tracking a high speed moving subject, you're gonna want the tracking to be set to fast. But if you're just sitting in front of the camera or you're doing something like I'm doing here, I think it looks better when it's set to slow. You know, so if you're talking about a product and you want to like transition to the product behind it, for example, like to show the packaging, it looks nice and smooth when you have the transition speed set slower. So that's what that feature does. Now, the other option is that subject shift responsiveness. And if you change that, that will just slow down the responsiveness when you put something in front of the camera. All right, so check this out. All right, so see how it just focused on the lens cap? Now watch when I pull it away. Do you see how it took a second or two before it focused on the face? Same thing with the lens cap. You see how it took a second? That's because responsiveness I just lowered. Now watch what happens when I put the responsiveness back to fast, or I should say responsive. All right, so now I have it set to responsive. You see how fast it switches? 
it's almost immediate. The transition is still slow, but the actual time it takes for it to acquire focus is much faster. There's no delay. It just automatically, immediately goes right to the subject that you're putting in front of the camera. So why would you want to change this feature? In, in my opinion, I like to have it set to the middle. And the reason being is I talk with my hands a lot. And when I put my hand in front of the camera, sometimes it'll focus on the hand and my face goes blurry. And if you lower the responsiveness to like three, it'll give you, you can put your hand up in front of the camera for a second and then take it away and it'll still stay locked on your face. If you have it set to five and you put your hand up in front of the camera, it will, it just instantly will focus on your hand and that will create like a pulsating effect and it won't look good. So this is what responsive does. So if you do not want the focus to shift, you can leave it on locked on. And then you could have your hands in front and stuff, and it's just pretty much gonna stay locked on to what it's currently focused on. And it'll take a lot for it to switch or decide to switch. And that's the priority of the autofocus subject shift sensitivity. So that's what that feature does. Auto slow shutter, this is good for video. I recommend leaving that on because if you're in a situation where the shutter speed gets too slow, you want your video to keep working. You don't want it to go all dark on you. So what'll happen is the camera will automatically slow the shutter speed below you know, the frame rate that you're recording at just to make sure that the exposure is correct. Audio recording, you could turn that on and off here. Audio recording level, that's actually grayed out right now, probably because I'm in photography mode. Yeah, I'm in photography mode. Oh, by the way, even though I'm in photography mode, as you saw a second ago, I can still hit record and it'll start recording. So let me just change that to video mode though and go back in the menu. All right, so now I have the option to change the audio recording level audio level display you can turn that on and off because remember on the screen you see that those green bars that's the audio display so you can turn that on and off wind noise reduction you can turn that on and off here i recommend leaving it off and just using the wind diffuser steady shot now if you go into steady shot you can change that to active mode standard or off and remember i showed you that earlier when it's set to active it crops in a lot so you lose a lot of your wide angle lens when you have it set to active but you will definitely get far superior stabilization if you're walking and stuff so active is great for that purpose but it's not you lose a little bit because it crops in so that's where the steady shot options are marker display is a more advanced feature so i just leave all this stuff off for the most part marker settings movie with shutter i have that off record lamp that's the lamp that's on the front of the camera so if you don't want people to know you're recording them you can turn that off right here so record lamp, just turn that off and that light won't light up on the front. Cause when you see that light, people just know you're recording them. So yeah, you can turn that off right there. And then if you want to hit record with the shutter button, you can turn that on here if you want, but I'd leave that off. There's a big record button right there. So why would you do that? Silent shooting, it doesn't apply when in video mode, but if you want to shoot in photography mode and you want the camera to be silent, you can turn that on right there. Release without lens is a feature. If you're going to use a fully manual lens that has no electronics, the camera doesn't know if you have a fully manual lens attached because it has no electronics. So the camera won't take a photo or it won't record video because it thinks there's no lens attached. So if you go in here and you enable this, now you can attach a fully manual lens and the camera will just ignore it. It'll still take pictures and work normally even though the camera thinks there's no lens there because there's no electronics. So I would recommend enabling that if you have any possibility that you'll be using fully manual lenses at some point. I always leave mine on. And here's where you can turn steady shot on and off as well. Zoom range. If you go in here and you can adjust to optical zoom only, or you can have it set to clear image zoom. I really highly recommend setting it to clear image zoom. And I'll show you why. Check this out. So now if I zoom in, look up here on the top, you see that like zoom bar? There's like that bar there that shows you how far you're zoomed in. So right here is 50 millimeter. That is the end of the optical zoom. So I can't zoom in anymore with the actual lens, but you can still zoom in digitally with clear image zoom. So you can see it goes 1.5 times. So it gives you that little extra bit of zoom. It is a digital zoom guys, but you can't tell. Like it doesn't look digitized at all. And it works awesome in video and photography. Digital zoom, however, looks like garbage. Don't use that unless you have to. But that you can tell, that starts to pixelate and stuff. Clear image zoom does not. Now zoom lever speed. Right now, 
that's how fast the lens will zoom in and out. So watch this. If I'm uh, just zooming in and out while not recording, it goes that fast. And while recording, it'll go the same speed because they're both set to three. Zoom lever speed, see? So check this out. I'm going to change this to one. So the record speed I now have set to one. So watch, I'm going to record now. And now watch how slow it zooms. So that's its slowest zoom. And that looks much better in my opinion. It's much less herky-jerky and uh, it's a smoother, smoother look. The video footage is going to look better when it's set to a lower speed. And you have a lot of options here. So let me put it to six. Oh wow, it goes all the way to eight. All right, so let me show you what eight looks like. <laughs> Holy cow, that's fast. So yeah, and obviously the lens makes a lot of noise when you do it at fast as well. When it's set to slow, it goes way slower and it's way quieter. I'm gonna change this back to one. All right, so display button, remember on the top of this thumb dial is the display button. So you can actually control what screens you have in display modes. So you can turn these on and off. So when you hit the display button, it's gonna cycle through all these options. You can turn off the ones that you never use or don't wanna see, and uh, it'll be less toggles when you hit the display button. That's what that does. Zebra settings, this is an advanced exposure mode setting. What Zebra does is it overlays like a zebra pattern. So when I turn that on, I'll show you how what it looks like. You see that zebra pattern? That pattern where those zebras are is just telling you a specific brightness value. And it's a good way to judge exposures. Grid line, now if you turn the grid line on, I like rule of thirds. And what that does is it puts the grid on the screen. You see that crisscross there? And that'll help you line up your shot, use the rule of thirds to get a better composition and stuff. It also helps make sure you have the camera level. You could use those lines to make sure the camera's level. Great for water and things like that. Now the order of view time is how long the photo will display after you take a picture. So after you take a picture, the photo will display for two seconds. That might drive you crazy and you might wanna turn that off. I usually have it turned off, but it is nice sometimes to see the photo for a second or two. Now here you got custom keys. This is where you would go in to program your custom keys. And right now you could see that garbage can button is a custom key and it's set to product showcase. Now the custom button here in the center is not set. I would normally set this to magnify zoom if I was using manual lenses though, by the way. And then you got drive mode, ISO, exposure comp, and you got the custom button on the top. It's by default, uh, background defocus, and then the record button. So you can change these buttons to other options. Focus hold button, some lenses have a focus hold button on it. You can change that in here if you have one of those lenses. And again, if you wanna change it, just click on it and by using the center button here, and then you can go in and you can scroll through. You can see there's 25 pages of options here. So you would scroll through there and pick which one you need depending on what you're trying to do there. I'm just gonna leave it at default though. And you have custom keys for photo mode, video mode, and playback mode. So you can change these custom modes independently of what camera mode you're using. Again, just incredible power. Function menu set. If you go in here, you can custom configure your function menu. Remember the function menu is that awesome shortcut menu I was telling you about, and it changes depending on what mode you're in. So if you're in photography mode, these are the options that are gonna come up, and you can change these. You can go in here, and if you never use, you know, whatever, if you don't use creative style, you can get rid of that and put something else in there. You can configure this how you like it. Now you got the dial wheel set up. That just controls what this wheel does versus this wheel on the back. You can change that as well. Function of touch operation. Now, by default, it is set to touch tracking. You can change that though to touch focus if you want. If you don't want it to track your subject, you just wanna move the focus point. A lot of times I change this to touch focus because I don't necessarily want it to track. For example, if I touch focus in the center, it's gonna focus on that face and it's not tracking the face though. It's just focusing on that area. So if the face moves, it's not gonna track it. But if I go into the menu and I change that to touch track, now if I touch the face, it's gonna track it. And if I move the face around, 
you could see this the box coming up it's tracking the face that's because it's set to touch tracking so that's what that feature does and depending on what you're doing you might not want it to track you might want to change it to touch focus but in general touch tracking works amazing and that's where i have it set for the most part now touch shutter is grayed out and that's because i'm in video mode i believe let me change the mode here all right photography mode menu yeah touch shutter so now that i'm in photography mode you can actually have it set to touch shutter so if you want to enable touch shutter there's this little icon on the right top right of the screen it's hard to see it's gray so if you select that now there's like this little orange line there that's how you know touch shutter is enabled and ready to go so now when i touch it takes the shot pretty sweet right and to turn it on and off you have to hit this little button up here that overlays on the screen itself and that is the touch shutter option so if you want your camera to be perfectly quiet and you don't want to hear it when you hit record and stuff like that you can turn the audio signals off so you won't hear that beeping and stuff all right so now we're in the network area guys and here is where you would go to connect to a smartphone for example so if you have the imaging edge app installed on your smart device you can go in here and you can connect the camera to the smart device if you go in here you can send an image to the smartphone and that's what this function is i have several videos on the imaging edge app that will are in my how-to area so if you want to use that be sure to check those videos out because it's it's pretty in detail a lot of information there so i'm not going to go over it in this video pc remote function this feature you will need occasionally if you're trying to use your computer to remote control the camera or if you have the camera hooked up to a gimbal for example you would need to turn this on or off possibly depending and then in here you have a connection method usb so you can go in there you could see check it to wi-fi or access point again it's a pretty advanced feature and if you have pc remote function on you will also lose facial tracking and IAF. Unfortunately, it doesn't work when you have PC remote function on. So that could be causing you problems in the focusing area if you're not aware. Airplane mode is a great feature if you wanna save battery life. Set the camera to airplane mode on and a lot of all those network features and stuff will definitely all be turned off and you won't have to worry about like Bluetooth or anything like that draining your battery. Wi-Fi settings, you can go in here and you can adjust your Wi-Fi settings. You can change your name of the uh, Wi-Fi network and stuff like that. Bluetooth settings, uh, this is where you can go and you can turn that stuff on and off for connecting via Bluetooth. Some remote controls, for example, connect via Bluetooth. That's where you would go to enable that. Location info link set. This feature will basically take the GPS information off your smart device like your cell phone and it'll automatically embed that information into your photo bluetooth remote control you need to turn that on if you are using a bluetooth remote it's grayed out right now because the bluetooth function is turned off if you turn bluetooth on which is right here under bluetooth settings one page back that will ungray and then you can turn that on device name this is where you can edit your device name and stuff playback mode this is where you can go in and adjust your playback settings you can rate your images and stuff you can delete them rotate them protect them so you can't accidentally delete them in here you can go in and you can enlarge your image a couple other options continuous playback for interval shooting this is one of those features i wanted to show you after your interval shooting is completed in the playback menu it'll put it in like a group so you can actually go in here and you can do a continuous playback for your interval shooting and it'll play back your photos and it'll look like a time lapse so this is how you can preview your time lapses if you go into the playback menu and just look at it it's not going to be a completed time lapse it's going to be a series of images that you need to turn into a time lapse in post-processing but to get a preview of that you can go in here and select this option and then your playback speed you can also change here depending on what your interval shooting speed was when you recorded your interval shooting series so that's what this options are for slideshow this is another nice feature if you have your camera hooked up to a tv or a monitor and you want to do a slideshow to show you know like your family the photos from vacation or something just got a couple other settings here display as group on that's how remember how i was telling you how it groups photos together when you're in uh, continuous shooting mode you can turn that on and off here display rotation you can turn that on and off when we go into monitor brightness this is a feature that you're going to need to use because this camera does not have an electronic viewfinder 
see the electronic viewfinder on my A6400. So the ZV-E10 does not have an electronic viewfinder, so you have to rely on this LCD screen. And sometimes you can't see it because it's really bright out or there's glare or something like that. So that is a downside of this camera. But if you go in here to brightness setup, you can manually change the brightness. So you can raise it and lower it. So if you're in really dark conditions, you can lower it. Really bright conditions, you can raise it up so you can see the screen better. All right, so if you click on monitor brightness, just click on brightness again, and now look, you have this sunny weather option. This is how you make the screen crazy bright. So if you put it in sunny weather mode, the screen's gonna really be bright and it's gonna be much easier to see in like daylight when you're outside and stuff. So this is an important feature you need to know about. But if you have it on sunny weather mode, it's definitely gonna use more battery life. So be aware of that. Make sure you get extra batteries and turn off sunny weather mode when you're not, when you don't need it to help save some battery life. Now we got gamma display assist. This is a really powerful feature if you're using more advanced modes like S-Log, S-Log 3, HLG, which is HDR. And so you can simulate what that will look like by using the gamma display assist. Very, very powerful feature, but a much more advanced feature. You would use this if you were using picture profiles and S-Logs and things like that. Volume settings, you can change that there. Delete confirm, yes or no. Display quality, I have it set to standard, but you can make that high and it'll look a little bit better on the back of the screen if you wanna set the display quality to high, but it will use a little bit of extra battery life. Power setting options. This is where you can change how long the camera will be on for if you don't touch it. So if I stop touching the camera, it's gonna shut off in one minute. You can change that here. I usually have it set to two minutes um, because a lot of times I'll just be like doing something, but I don't want the camera to shut off. So two minutes works pretty good. Power saved by monitor. If you have it hooked up to a monitor, it'll automatically shut off. So order power off temperature. This is a really important feature. If you go in here, I would definitely change this to high. So this will make sure that the camera stays recording even if it gets hot and warm. Don't worry, it's not gonna hurt your camera. It just won't shut off when it gets warm. It'll stay on until it gets to the point where it has to shut off. And you'll get much longer record times if you have the temperature set to high. So make sure you set that to high. So if you go in here and you enable this, it'll do some kind of sensor cleaning. So this is a good option if you have dust on the sensor, give that a try. You can turn touch operation on and off. If you're one of those people that keeps touching the screen by accident and the focus mode gets stuck or something because you know you touched in the corner and you missed a bunch of shots and it, it just keeps happening, it's driving you crazy, you can turn touch operation off. Just turn that feature off. You don't even have to use it, it's right there. This is time code and user bit settings. This is a more advanced feature for video users when you're syncing multiple cameras together. You can use what's called time code and you, you, it'll be easier to sync up all that footage in post-processing. HDMI settings, this is where you would go to change your HDMI settings for that micro HDMI output. So you might have to change some of these settings depending on what kind of monitor you are plugging in and you can turn features on and off like display features. So if you're playing back and you don't want the overlays to be on the screen, you can turn that stuff off here. I actually like leaving it on when I'm using it as a monitor though, so I can see the information. USB power supply, that's turned on. So if you have the if you have a power cable plugged into the camera, it will charge the camera while you're using it. Um, it's like a trickle charge though. The camera will still ultimately die, but it will take a lot longer to die if you have a charger plugged in while you're using it. And this is where you would change your language, date, time, and area. We already have that set up. Now here you got format. This is where you would format the memory card. And you can go in there and do that very simply. File folder settings, you can change the name of your file folder and files. File settings here for video. If you go in here, I'm gonna change the name here. File name format, I'm gonna to go to, instead of standard, I'm gonna select title. All right, so now I just gotta to go to page two and now I can change the title settings. So I'm gonna go in here like so and it works just like, you know, any like anything when you have to type stuff in like on the TV and stuff. To Z, V, E, Z, V, E, 10 and then I'm just gonna put an underscore like so and click OK. So now when I record video, the video file is gonna have ZVE10 underscore and then like a number after it. And that's a way 
better way you could see here that's what it's going to look like something like that so if i'm recording with multiple cameras i got my a6400 i got this i got an a7c i got a gopro you know that it'll be much easier to navigate and find like i'll know right out of the way oh that video file that 4k file it was shot with a zv e10 and uh, it's a great way to go i highly recommend changing that it'll help you in the future it's a good workflow just concept in my opinion click ok and that is set and then recover image database you can just check that if you want there let me go to the right display media info this will just tell you how much space you have left on the memory card pretty much version will tell you the firmware so you can see here it's at version 1.0 this is a brand new camera i just got and then settings reset. This is where you can go to initialize the camera back to factory default, which is what I did to start this video because I wanted to show you how to set the date and time and stuff. So I just initialized it. That's where you go to do that. Now, if you go over to the right, you have this awesome section here called the My Menu Settings. And this is where you can set your settings. So your favorite settings. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna click Add. And I'm gonna do File Format and I'm gonna put it in that location. So that's added. And then I'm gonna do, I'm gonna to go to the right here, interval shooting, I'm gonna add that. Soft skin effect, I might wanna turn that on and off. I'm gonna add that. File format, record setting, gonna add that. And for now, that's pretty good. So now if I go into menu, notice my menu now has two pages. You got the add, sort, delete, and this, so this is how you manipulate what you have in your menu system. And if you go back to page one, this is actually my menu. These are the items I just added. So now I got all these items in there and I can quickly get to them without having to remember where they are in the menu. So this is a super powerful feature. And now you can program this with multiple pages of, you could put a ton of crap in here, not just one page, you could have like four or five pages. So that about wraps up this beginner's guide. If you guys have any questions and you want me to do more tutorials on this camera, please let me know. But for this video, I just wanted to get you going and really show you how to use this camera and how to get the most out of it because it's extremely powerful. So I really hope you got what you were looking for in this video. If you did, please do me a favor, give me a thumbs up. And uh, also be sure to subscribe, be sure to share the video. And don't forget below the video, there will be links to recommended accessories for this camera. If you're looking for that, please have a great day. You ask questions if you have them, I'm happy to help and I will absolutely catch up with you guys next time. Take care.